our recording. Awesome. So I know we have uh, individuals that are just joining right now. I am going to go ahead and get started here, though, because we have a very, very exciting session that we're going to have today. Um, this is a very special thank you to CEI, the Center for Educational Innovation, and they are bringing this to us um, about esports. And esports is just one of those areas that, quite frankly, as a parent, I don't always think about, maybe not in a positive light, but it's one of the fastest growing um, markets that are out there right now. And this is a really great way to capture students, to get their engagement, to get their involvement in it. And I think it also looks at that innovative side of things. And so we want our students to be those critical thinkers, problem solvers, innovators for today and tomorrow. And so instead of kind of saying, yikes, you know, we're looking at technology and being on video games as a negative, this is a real way to think about it being a positive. And how can we support our students to understand this, to go deeper into this? And there's so much opportunity out in the world with esports. And so I don't want to take any further time here because we've got the experts on the phone. We have both uh, Jad and, and Vince. And so I'm going to turn it over to the two of you because you also have incredible background. So I'd love for you to just first start off by introducing yourselves because I will not do it justice. And I'll tell you, they were at the STEM Leadership Alliance Summit in Florida, and I thought it was pretty darn cool. So I'm going to send it over to you guys. Thank you. So yeah, so my name is Josh Schmelzer. I'm the director of esports at the Center of Education and Innovation. Um, I started the program three years ago. We started off as an after school. Uh, we started off the, as a summer camp, uh, turned into an after school program, which then morphed into uh, after school during the day, uh, and just pretty much a, a full full fledged kind of esports organization. Uh, so a lot of what we're doing is we're, we're, we're interacting with schools in different capacities. Uh, we're also interacting with different esports organizations uh, and, and really trying to bring esports and gaming um, to, to more of a educator's um, yeah. kind of standpoint and point of view. So that's a little bit on my background. And then uh, I'll let Vince kind of go, go a little bit deeper into to his background. All uh, right, thanks, Jad. Uh, yes, my name is Vincent Valerio. Um, I actually was a professional gamer before I started here at CEI, but now currently I'm a uh, esports coordinator with CEI. Um, before all that, believe it or not, I also was an attorney, um, and it was just—it's been a wild ride. I'm really happy that I got involved with CEI, kind of bringing in my experience from uh, being in esports to now being uh, a teacher in not only Summit Academy but a bunch of schools around New York City. I've taught everything from second grade to uh, senior year of high school in the last six months. So I feel like it gives me a unique perspective on uh, what we have going here and the field of esports. So uh, I'm glad to be here with Jack. Awesome. So, so yeah, so what we're going to try and dive into today, we, we want to kind of cover three topics. So uh, we want to kind of cover engagement, engagement for students and, and how we use esports uh, to, to kind of get the students either wanting to come to school, wanting to come to class, wanting to be in the after school program, and just wanting to be involved uh, with, within our kind of school community. Uh, the second piece is, is kind of a special one for us is the social emotional learning. So SEL and, and gaming is, is a very interesting topic that not many are really touching upon, but, but we've really started to kind of dive into and, and go, go really, um, you know, kind of head on with and then the last thing, which is, is really where, where Vince will kind of take over and, and, and kind of steal the show with, is uh, the Summit Gaming Lab. So uh, over the last, I'd say last like six months, we've basically transformed a classroom into basically an esports arena. Um, and, and we'll be able to kind of give you a little bit more insight toward, towards the end of that. Um, but so the way that we kind of look at engaging with students uh, we, we kind of look at it from, from three pillars. So we look at it from the academic side, we look at it from the gaming side, and then we look at it from the experiential side. Um, so as, as Vince kind of said earlier, you know, he's, he was a professional gamer. He still is a professional gamer. Um, but, you know, Vince, when you were growing up, how many professional gaming events did you go to? I'd be a big zero, Judd. Yeah, so... 
Um, how, how about in the classroom when, when you're going, when you're, you know, in middle school or high school, how many classes actually had anything around gaming and, and areas of, of interest that, that really sparked your, your interest? Uh, I would say the only thing was a sixth grade computer class I had in elementary school where we played Oregon Trail. But besides that, uh, that was the only gaming I did in my entire high school, middle school career. So as you're kind of getting the picture here with Vince, you know, he, he became a professional gamer just because of his passion and, and what he kind of wanted to do and, and the direction that he kind of uh, ended up going in. And, and what we've done is we've, we, we started off kind of building out our program without any true background and understanding from the professional side. Uh, it started off more from the education and the academic side. And then as we've added in talent like Vince, uh, to our program, it's allowed us to expand the academic into the gaming. So being able to provide insights and training and techniques and tips uh, to the students to actually help them get better. Uh, in addition to also opening up doors were opportunities for us to bring students out to gaming events, bring students out to actually gaming centers um, and actually connect the students with players as well. Um, so th those are the three pillars that we kind of get into. Um, and, and I'll kind of let th this next piece, I'll kind of let Vince kind of dive into the academic side of, of, of things. Absolutely. Thank you, Jad. So on the screen right now, you're going to see a digital citizenship uh, slide. Uh, it's from our digital citizenship lesson and kind of just going over what digital, digital citizenship is and why it's so important to me. It's kind of how you act in the online uh, community. And it's a little bit of the wild, wild west right now. I can tell you from my experience being in the 2K, uh, I play NBA 2K. That's the game of choice for my profession. And just being in the Twitch chats and being on Twitter and social media, you kind of see that uh, the, the students need direction in these types of things. Uh, there's really no one focusing on how you're acting in a Twitch stream or how you're acting on social media, and what type of effect that that's having on the people around you. So this digital citizenship lesson we actually created from scratch. Uh, addressing a lot of the issues that I've seen uh, in my in my career, dealing with the kids and um, I apologize, not the kids, my 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 other professionals in the league. Um, and we also focus on you see cyberbullying on the slide, harassment. It's just really about uh, not only building out skills for gaming, but also life skills that are going to apply to other things. One of the huge uh, things we try to address is that a lot of these kids in this generation below me, and I'm 33, so maybe two generations below me between social media and gaming being so dominant, they've kind of lost some uh, human interaction that I might've gotten from sports or just you know being outside more in my childhood. So that's where this lesson kind of centers around. Um, if you wanna to go to the next one, Jack. Real quick, as far as, far as what you've seen from, from the professional side of, of things to yeah. kind of the classroom side of things, mm -hmm. you know, as you're doing these lessons and working with the students and, and not just your own school, but the other schools that you've worked with and done this lesson, what, what has kind of been the impact or, or what is some of the things that you've seen from the students in terms of yeah. um, how, they may, how they may have acted before and how they may have interacted with you during the conversation with, with these lessons being kind of delivered? So the two things that I would say stick out from this lesson the most is one, we have a, a huge emphasis on using the word GGs, which stands for good game. Um, it is a very basic uh, respect thing in the gaming community, but I noticed that a lot of the kids, you know, some of them like to rage when they lose. Nobody likes losing, but we really have implemented that, that no matter what happens, how intense the game is, they're always using GGs after the game, giving each other a handshake. It's something that I mandate if they're going to be playing in my classroom because I know how it happened. If, if that's unchecked for years and years, it kind of leads to having an ego and maybe being disrespectful. And I'd say the second thing, we actually have a whole women in gaming uh, section of this lesson as well. And it's something I'm super adamant about because I know how far behind uh, the population is with having women in gaming in the esports community. So that one was really huge because a lot of the younger students didn't realize that this was something that was going on because they're playing with girls all the time and, uh, you know, in parties, uh, people that they're friends with. So I really noticed a, a, a want to ask me, why is this happening? Why, why do you think there's not more girls? And, and I was very surprised by that, very happy that the students were in, extremely engaged and wanted to help out trying to uh, have more of their uh, friends that are girls play with them in, in lobbies. All right, so the next, the next slide. Now this, this, this one, uh, just to give a little insight, every time I teach this lesson, I tell the kids that I used to get left in an arcade by my parents when they would deal with other stuff. 
And I was that kid going under the, uh, the, the arcade games looking for quarters. But uh, with this one, our real, our real emphasis is just showing the history of gaming. It's kind of sad to me. I know it makes me feel old that a lot of kids don't even realize that arcade gaming at one point was the main competitive gaming scene. You go to a, you know, an arcade and you don't leave for hours and hours and hours playing against other people. And uh, I think it really shows them, first off, where the graphics have come from and how much they've improved. Uh, the accessibility of being able to play instead of having to pay to play, having consoles at home. Um, I think the biggest thing for a lot of the kids is that they, they laugh. They're like, you spend your time on arcade. They got consoles at home. They have a Nintendo switch. They have, you know, VR or D, uh, Nintendo DS. They have all these different consoles. They don't even see the necessity for it where I'm sitting there. Like I spent so much of my childhood here, but you have to respect this. But yeah, this lesson kind of just gives them a, a breakdown of what was going on in the seventies, eighties, how the competitive gaming scene started. Other parts of this lesson go into like the first video game ever uh, the evolution of consoles from the first Xbox all the way up to now, the first PlayStation. And, uh, you know, I was really surprised about how many kids knew about these older consoles. And it shows how pervasive gaming and esports is with the younger students. Um, so some of them even knew what an N64 was. And I, I was very proud. I was very happy. <laughs> yeah. And, and the other piece, too, as you know, as we're talking about gaming and as we're talking about the academic lessons, the reasons why we actually really thought about this and wanted to give them the history is, you know, we also want this to be a conversational piece for parents. Uh, so we want the parents to be able to engage. Uh, so if, if a parent asks, you know, what did you learn today? Uh, and, and they talk about, you know, they, they go home and they might answer the question of, you know, we actually learned about arcades and, and video gaming and arcades and how you used to have to pay a quarter to do it. Um, and play, you know, Mario and Donkey Kong and, and, and all those games. So it, it, it's really a way for us to start the exploration into the world of gaming and, and really start to get them to understand that from the academic side, um, there is an opportunity to see the growth and see the evolution of how these games are made, how these games are delivered, how these games are being marketed. So it, it really kind of brings everything into, into light for not just the students, but also for the parents. So as the students, you know, go home and interact and, and potentially um, talk to their moms or dads or brothers or grandmas or grandpas, um, you know, everyone has had at some point some type of video game experience. Um, and so these are what we look at to, to really start and, and spur conversations uh amongst the the the, the students and, and the families yeah and just to add on top of that jad uh you're, it's so funny you mentioned the parents because the person who knew the n64 actually was because they uh had been losing to their dad in mario kart for the past five years so that's really funny that you brought that up and i also think it helps with the teachers when i do have uh teachers in there with me that maybe are not familiar with esports they see kind of games that they used to play and then all of a sudden they're intrigued buy in and, and that buy in helps us uh, makes our life easier because the teachers respect what we're doing. Uh, it transfers down kind of top to bottom. And um, I had one more point, but I don't remember Jad. So I'm gonna let you go to the next. <laughs> All right. So this is the interesting piece where, where we just gave you a quick kind of snippet of, of how we work the academic side of it. Um, but but this is where this is where we start to kind of differentiate ourselves from from the other uh, kind of people that are, are getting into this space. Yeah. So um, as you could see here, um, you know, it's called hitbox visualizations. So this specific lesson actually comes from our Super Smash Academy, um, where we're actually helping the students understand how to use the characters. So. We give a background on the gaming side of things, but, but now we actually start to dive in depth and give details around how to actually use the characters and how to actually understand what is happening in the game itself. Um, and and, and before, before you dive into this, Vince, um, from, from your background of, of you know, being a professional player, how did you learn how to become better at, at, at playing uh, 2K? For me, uh, honestly, it was just reps. Uh, just keep playing, keep playing, keep playing type of thing. And it, it's uh, my game is uniquely uh, uniquely different than most because it changes every single year. But, um, you know, watching film all on my own, basically. You know, I, I didn't have any assistance at all growing up trying to figure out how to learn this 
Um, luckily, I was older, and uh, it was a little bit easier for me to understand. But I'll I'll build off of uh, whatever your response is to that. Yeah, and 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 that that's really where this guide kind of comes into play. So so you know, Vince had to learn on his own, and Vince just had to kind of push buttons and and just spend tons of hours of just figuring out how things work, going online, reaching out to maybe friends or brothers or or anybody else that might be playing the game. Where now we're actually providing the material. So we're providing you what exactly it is, how this works, why this why this player does X, Y, and Z. And now we're giving you the details. So whether you want to work with, whether you want to work with yourself on this and go back and look at the material, whether you want mom or dad to kind of come in and help, or whether you want one of the teachers to kind of step in. Um, this is where providing this level of material for um, everybody is really where we kind of see the, 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 the growth um, from the gaming side, because you know, having a coach who actually knows this material is very, very difficult to find. Um, so if we could provide 90% of the material and just hope that, you know, the coach can provide the other 10%, we feel that it's going to leave our students in, in kind of a, a, a good position to succeed. Absolutely. And I, I really, um, I have to give credit to Coach Lopez on this, one of our other instructors for putting together the smash and also Isaac, uh, two of our, uh, two of my colleagues. Because basically, I have never been a Smash player. I've only played 2K. So when they presented this content to me to use for the kids and to just use in the future, it is unbelievably detailed, unbelievably specific. And it's things that kids will just play for years and years and not figure out. So I think that the combination of its detailedness with its um, it being easy to understand in very simple language for different uh, grade levels is, is just paramount to what we do. Um, I also have, you know, gentlemen talking about the 2K team as well. You know, having someone like uh, Coach Lopez and uh, uh, Isaac on our team that knows Smash very well, I know 2K very well, we're providing competitive uh, instruction for the kids at an earlier age than I think anywhere else is doing right now. And I wish I had that. It's the reason why I'm so passionate about it. Like Jad said, I spent hours and hours trying to figure it out on my own. And it's, you know, not everybody knows the answers to these questions. It's not a 1% part of the population that plays at the highest level. So, it's not always easy to get there on your own. Yep. And and with my background and, and kind of a, a, a little bit of a breakdown for everyone to understand is, you know, I, I came from the professional baseball world. So for me, coaching uh, was something that I, I've been, you know, I've been coached ever since I was probably seven, eight years old with baseball. Um, and so I've kind of taken that same philosophy of, of how do we how do we take high level information and provide that high level information to the younger the, the younger group of, of people but also be able to use that same level of information for high school students college students or anybody else that are interested in the game and these graphics here you know it, it really dives into detail of, of how the character itself is actually functioning in the game so as you could see here you know you could see there's red marks there's blue there's purple marks those are really what the student will look at this and then start to ask the questions. How do I get the most out of this player? And how do I kind of get to utilize this in the way that the, the game was made to be utilized? Absolutely. So the, the, the second piece that we kind of dive into here, um, which kind of takes us a little bit farther, is, is kind of the breakdown of, of how we kind of run our program. So for Super Smash in particular, uh, there's a lot of characters that, you know, everyone has a type of character that they like or a specific character or type of game style that they like to play. Um, so here you could see Kirby is an all arounder. Um, King K, King K rule is a heavyweight and snake is a zoner. So for a lot of people looking at this for the first time, not understanding what smash is now, this gives you the material to start to say, all right, maybe I'm going to do either a Google search of what all rounder is or what a heavyweight is or what zoner is for super smash. Or as you kind of go through our, our content, we actually start to provide the history, the background, the understanding of the tactics and skills that kind of go into each, each skill set. Um, and then what I want to kind of dive into here as well is the additional offerings that we have for not just the students, but for the parents, the teachers, the educators, and, and kind of everybody is, 
we have a podcast that we put out. So we have a podcast that we interview people. We interview people from the industry, whether it's players, uh, GMs, front office, coaches, um, marketing teams. We want to provide as much information as possible. So we, we look at this as a way of, you know, outside of being in the classroom, how else can we make an impact? And, and the podcast is a really, really interesting and unique way. We also have a magazine, which gets distributed on a seasonal basis. So we have fall, winter, spring, and summer editions. Um, our la we actually have a new one that's going to be coming out October 31st. Uh, we'll be able to provide that link um, once, once this uh, wraps up, and, and maybe we could email that out as well. And then lastly, the, what, what I think is the most important one that we've kind of really started building out in, in the last year or two is the career day. Um, so as we're talking about the academic side of things, um, you know, we're introducing the students to this, this world of, of gaming and telling them that this is not just a thing that you could, you know, and this is not just playing, playing the game, that there's other career pathways that exist. So um, here's, here's our Reaching and Teaching podcast. Here's a little bit of our socials. Uh, you can kind of check us out if, if, uh, if you want to kind of see some of the interviews. Um, here we have Dirk and Harris, who are actually in the top left. You'll see they're actually uh, the host and broadcasters for the 2K League itself. Um, and we kind of, we have Brendan Donahue all the way to the right. We have Alec Posley down on the bottom, Kevin Mitchell, Autumn Johnson. So a lot of these people are people that are in the esports and gaming space, uh, that are doing this for a living, that have a passion behind this. And a lot of the information here, um, is what we try and deliver to the students during the day. Um, but if we can't deliver all of that, then we, there's these additional resources for them as well. Um, here's a little snippet of kind of what the magazine looks like and, and how the kind of magazine will, will kind of feel, but it's all about providing educational content. Um, and, and all the magazine, all the articles in the magazine are written in house by our own staff. So we are interacting with the students. We're interacting with the schools. We get a very good understanding of kind of what the students are looking for or craving or even just topics that they might be interested in. Um, and so this is kind of where we dive into, into that area. Um, here's the career day. So you guys can actually have access to this as well. Uh, our website is esportscareerday.com. Um, and these are eight of our individuals who have kind of worked and teamed up with us and that have done some interviews. Um, and, you know, Justin Jacobson on the top right, he's, he's a, you know, an attorney in the space, Erin Ashton Simon. She's actually now an, uh, a part owner of a team called Exet. Um, Jeff Eisenband is a broadcaster. He's done everything from, uh, you know, from, from gaming to actually PGA and, and getting involved in baseball and, and sports and fantasy and everything like that. Um, Autumn Johnson in the top left, same thing. She has a college, uh, she, she's been working uh, for college basketball in addition to kind of being uh, the host for uh, the, the NBA 2K League. And the bottom left is a local uh, New York land center owner, Alec Posley. He, uh, he owns and operates uh, Brookland which is a really, really cool gaming venue, uh, which, which is based in Brooklyn. Um, it's been around for a couple of years now, and, and it's, really, it's really a unique and, and, and very cool interactive site for uh, not, just, not just gamers, but for, for any individual. So this next piece that, that we're gonna dive into is, is the social emotional learning in video games. Uh, so, I guess, I guess my question to you, Vince, is when we're looking at, at, at kind of the SEL lessons and, and as we built this out, um, what, was, what was the one takeaway that, that you kind of took from, from learning about kind of the SEL and, and video games and, and the opportunities that exist? Um, that's a very good question. I think I kind of alluded to it before. Um, it's just that there's a gap right now between the kids who play video games a lot and maybe what they've received in social emotional learning so far. Um, and again, it always comes back to my experiences um, from being a professional gamer and dealing with people who are as old as 26 and still need social emotional learning. 
Um, and it's something that really drove my research and the lessons that I ended up putting together in this vein. Uh, and I would say my main takeaway is that the kids just need more engagement with each other and with people who understand what they're trying to do and have role models that are in front of them showing them, hey, yeah, I was a lawyer and that's a great job and it took a lot of work to get there. But at the same time, if you want to be a professional gamer, you got to go and follow your dreams, but do it the right way, not just think it's, oh, I play video games and I'm going to be a professional gamer. No, know that I played for 13 hours a day, 14 hours a day and had to do a lot of networking and work on myself and become more mature. So it's kind of giving them the, hey, it's possible, but are you really ready to put in the work in the social emotional space and in the, uh, you know, obviously in the gaming space? Yep. And so, so we, we basically were able to develop this, this little bit of a model called the e-sporting mind. Um, so we kind of looked at the five areas that we thought were, were the most important, um, starting with communication, leadership, problem solving, teamwork, and character. So from, from the baseball side and, and my background, um, all of these really, all of these areas is really what, what I feel kind of builds um, both character amongst, um, amongst the team, but also amongst yourself. And a lot of these lessons are lessons that we've integrated gaming to make the students understand that in order to, you know, in order to become a professional, uh, in order to play the game at the highest level, you actually need a little bit of, of each of these. And you need to be able to, you know, focus in and lock in on areas that you're weak in and know which areas that you're strong in. And so, you know, specifically for you, Vince, you know, give us, give us a little bit of your background in terms of the game that you play. Uh, so for, for, for some of the people that are kind of tuning in that don't know much about the NBA 2K League and how the professional um, game works, uh, give us a little breakdown of, of, of how the, the game itself is different, because I'm sure a lot of people are saying, well, well, why would you need social emotional learning in NBA 2K when you're just, just controlling one player? Okay, so yeah, that is, that is a great point, Jai. Let me dive into it a little bit. Again, we play on the video game NBA 2K, whatever the newest year is. Right now, it's 2K23. But the interesting part about our eSport is that it's actually five players, a point guard, a shooting guard, a lockdown, a power forward, and a center. Um, a lot of people, when I talk to them, believe it's just 1v1 with all five players. No, we actually control each player on the court. So what that means is it's basically transferring uh, uh, in real-life basketball into the video game. And what that means is that everything is about communication. You know, I, I know that's only one of the five, but it's a huge part of what we do because it's such a reaction-based game and a timing-based game that if you're not in sync with your teammates, everyone, um, how do I explain this? There's no LeBron James who's six foot nine and every uh, game he comes out, he just has that athletic advantage. We all play the game at a high level. So the way you win in the margins is having better communication, better uh, leadership, uh, better teamwork, better problem solving, these five things that are here. Um, and that's what I feel like me being older, getting into the space after I've already been an attorney and I'd already you know, worked a lot of jobs in the professional space, allowed me to use that side of me and that I've been a professional and worked on a team to kind of uh, be a better teammate. But yeah, it's, it's really fun to talk to people about it. They don't, they don't really know a lot about it, but it is five people on the court. If you're not working in sync, you're not communicating, you're not uh, accountable, all those different type of things that are involved in real basketball, you're going to struggle uh, mightily on the court in uh, virtual basketball as well. And, and I think too, as, as we're diving on this topic, um, you know, from, from, from your specific position and, and how you play, um, you know, from a leadership standpoint, uh, there, there's, there's kind of two leaders on, 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 yes. on the court. So mm -hmm. give, give us a little breakdown in terms of, of what, what exactly that means. Yeah. So, uh, you know, speaking in general terms, there's usually the point guard is usually the leader on offense. Uh, he's calling out all the plays. He's, uh, you know, making all the passes. He has the ball in his hands, you know, 90% of the time on offense. So he's using the leader on offense, but on the best teams, usually they take a step back. And on defense, it's normally either my position, the power forward, or the lockdown, controlling the defense, calling out the rotations, calling out cuts, uh, making sure everybody is just tightened up on their, on their side of the ball. I, I think that's a very intriguing thing because sometimes people overstep those boundaries or don't do enough, let one person do too much. 
finding that perfect balance with that is extremely difficult and is why there's, you know, obviously only a couple of teams that are truly elite every year. Yeah. And, and, and so, so now that we've kind of covered that, that topic of leadership, we've kind of covered that topic of communication. Uh, let, let's talk real quick about problem solving. Absolutely. There's never, there's, there's never a problem, right. In, 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 in a game, right. Oh man. So basically the way to describe 2k. So I'll tell you from a power forwards perspective where I focus mainly on defense, every single possession is basically a problem that needs to be solved. Uh, and there's, uh, you know, maybe 80, I don't know. I've never counted how many possessions there actually are in a game, but think about 80 to a hundred possessions in a game, dependent on turnover, dependent on pace. So every possession I'm reacting to what the point guard is doing on the other team. And it's basically a chess match the entire game. Who's going to, you know, who's going to make the right prediction. Who's going to make the right move, who reacts fast enough. So it's uh yeah, it gets a little intense. Definitely, definitely very, definitely very intense. All right. So, so, uh... Knowing, knowing your background from the professional side of that and knowing that you also play other games for fun. Yeah. Uh, I know, I know you've kind of started diving into the world of multiverses, which is uh, a similar game to super smash, yeah. uh, but, but from a different publisher uh, with different characters, but still it's a fighting game. Um, how would you, how would you kind of correlate what we're doing from the esporting mind of, of, uh, of emphasizing these different characters and these different kind of components uh, to a different title. Does it go back and forth? So, so multiverses is a fighting game. You can play one V one or two V two. Um, I believe that all, almost all of the same principles are involved. It's just the way the situations arise might be a little bit different, but when you get to the highest level of it, and I've never been a professional multiverses player, but I have played enough where I felt like I started playing people who are a little bit better you see that number one problem solving there. Um, it, although it's less problems to be solved because the matches are shorter, that same idea of, okay, are they going to dodge here? Are they going to punch here? Are they not? Are they using their special here? Are they using this? That kind of transferred over very easily for me. I would say communication is huge as well because the fact that if every character has different, different setups, different moves that are strong, different angles that get people off the map quicker. Um, I would say that leadership is huge as well because I think that, if you could, leadership for me isn't always just about being the leader. It's also noticing when someone is a better leader than you. I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. But just knowing who's the, you know, the main person making call outs on what they're doing in the fighting game as well. Teamwork, obviously, if you're playing 2v2 is extremely important. I think character is huge for the fighting games because you're going to lose a lot. Like you're losing 2k a lot, but just the how quick the matches are in multiverse, you, you kind of end up just having to lose to get better. It's just part of the game. Yeah. And so we'll, we'll dive quickly here into kind of what, what a, a lesson looks like, um, what a lesson looks like from, from the, uh, from the, the e-sporting mind. Yeah, so um, this is a lesson uh, or, or part of a lesson that I created based on my experiences in 2K. Um, there's a lot of writing on this page because there's a lot of information on leadership in 2K that matters. Um, and it was super important for me to just get into the, Maybe they don't understand all of it yet. It's always there for them to reference, but just I wanted to get into the intricacies of leadership because, yeah, it sounds great. Everybody wants to be a leader, but sometimes people don't understand why their leader is necessary and what it does. And me being a role player as a power forward for offense, I understand what it's like to sit there and have to listen and have structure and just be a tool for the leader of the offense. And that's something that took me a while. I, I wasn't always great at that. It kind of, is something that you develop when you become more mature and you say, hey, it's all about winning, even though everyone says that they don't always act out that way. It's all about winning. Even if my point guard is 18 years old and I'm 33, I know he put the time in on the game. He's my leader. If he tells me to cut or I did something wrong, I have to respect it and you know move on and not take it personally. So I, I focus on certain aspects here, especially having your teammates feel less pressure due to their roles being clearly defined. That one is tremendous for me. Because we're a video game and a lot of people are very skilled at the game, we sometimes have people who have huge egos who don't want to fit into certain roles, end up overstepping their boundaries, then it causes strife with the team. So having a clear leader for me was about, you know, defining roles and making sure everyone knows what is expected from them every day we come out on the court. Awesome. And then this, this, this last slide before we, we, we get into the fun stuff. Yeah, so this last slide, I kind of always like to end with just let's 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 hit them with three points 
hopefully they're at the end. I like, you know, first and last, I think it's recency bias. I, I see that the students tend to really engage with what I put at the end or what I put in the beginning. So I'll put it in caps. You can't not see this on the Promethean board that I have. A true leader in 2K is someone who their teammates admire and aspire to be like. That's my definition of a leader or part of it. And it's something that I, again, it's one of the reasons I also work with Jad. He's someone that I admire and aspire to be like, you know, just to get some brownie points with my boss. But <laughs> those are the type of things you want to look for when you get older is, okay, maybe I'm not the best here, but is this person, you know, someone I want to be like? Is this someone that is doing the things that I know I should be doing? It keeps a level of professionalism on and off the court as you see the second point. And then you can never expect someone to do what you're not willing to do yourself. I've seen a lot of people be very entitled in my community just because they're very good at the game, don't understand the re reciprocation that's necessary to being a professional and a teammate. So these are the things I'm trying to emphasize on the uh, social emotional learning section of things. And so ju just for everyone who, who's kind of tuning in and watching this, whether it's right now or whether it's down the road, um, after this point in the lesson, uh, and this is where we kind of recap and then this is where we let the students go in game. Yeah. So at, at this point, this is where the, the emphasis now actually becomes where when the students are actually playing, um, Vince is able to kind of roam around the classroom, kind of work with the actual students, uh, whether he's actually listening to what conversations are happening while the students are playing or whether he's providing some input on what he's seeing happening. Um, but this is where we kind of get them to understand and reflect and, and go back to the lesson, go back and understand, hey, this is what we discussed today. This is the emphasis. Let's make sure that we're executing this. And this is where we really see that the eSporting Mind has a very interesting influence um, because it, it, it is another lesson. It is another academic kind of component to the day that they've already gone through you know, four or five, six hours of school. And now they're getting this additionally, but this is also a way for them to take what they're learning here in the classroom with us and then bring it back to the school, bring it back to maybe maybe a, a, a program that they're doing, whether they're maybe they're playing basketball, soccer, football, or, or any type of sport activity outside. Um, so we, we look at the eSporting Mind as really as a way for us to engage with the students and, and, and use this opportunity to pr really put our stamp and say, social emotional learning is not just for sports. It's not just for the classroom. It's also for gaming as well. Absolutely. And just to build off what you said, just real quick, Dad, I just think that that reinforcement is so necessary. It doesn't always happen, but I've had kids, especially, you know, with the leadership lesson, you know, they're not lead, they're not being leaders right after that. And I definitely can reference back to the lesson, but. Uh, yeah, we're now on to my uh, my big yeah. my project. So so when when Vince when Vince took over Vince took over Summit. Um, basically, he started he started this September at the school, uh, but but during the summertime is when 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 we really started to kind of build out and understand yeah. what we're doing. Um, so we see a really nice logo here. Um, but this logo basically what was brought to life because of Vince. Um, so, so everything that we're about to see here, uh, it happened over from, I'd say from July uh, or August, um, through now and, and, and it's continuing to kind of evolve, uh, as we go. So, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let Vince kind of take it away from here. All right. Yeah. Just, I, I just want to go back to that slide one more time. I love that logo so much, uh, based it off of my experiences being to about, I would say, 13 or 14 different campuses and esports arenas around the country, including a bunch of 2K League um, uh, teams arenas. So my one of our guys, Greg, he's a digital artist. He really put his foot in this one. This one is it makes me happy. It makes the kids happy. And it just encapsulates exactly what I think an esports logo should. It should inspire fun and uh, get the kids to want to play. So let's go. Let's get that video going, Chad. You know, it took me 10 takes to get this video. So. <laughs> All right. You want to give a little description yeah. as, as we're going? So as we're walking in, you'll see on the right there, we have our esports arena poster. Uh, and we have the analysis to the right. I, wore, I really wanted to show off this touchscreen 75-inch Promethean board that I get to use every day. Makes my life extremely easy. 
over here on the uh, in the middle we actually i call it the learning area it's kind of a hub that i use for the kids to kind of circle around while i'm teaching the lesson on the right here we have four switch consoles with 30 inch uh curved monitors that run at 200 hertz with a bunch of adapters for different controllers we also have a controller cubby back here that is fully chargeable it's actually charging the controllers as we speak there with 18 xbox controllers and then we're going to move to the left here there's actually i believe 12 xboxes in the room uh, brand new Xbox Series X with a green screen back there. And now you're going to get to see the magic of the 300 feet of LED lights that we put in the room, also with textured wallpaper and soundproofing in there. Uh, when I'm teaching and once I have the kids playing, it's kind of a little surreal when I'm in there. I wish I had something like this when I was in high school. And uh, it gets me happy every day once I turn the lights on uh, and turn the lights off at the same time. <laughs> and And as we're so you know, as we're, as we're looking in and as we're kind of building this out, we, we, we took this classroom and kind of transformed it. So you, you can kind of see here, we have sound panels up there. Uh, we have wallpaper that we laid. There's, there's some posters that we kind of have up there. So we, we wanted to really make sure that when the students kind of entered into this room, um, that they understood what, what the mission was. And yeah. when, when, when you come into this room, not only the fact that you have Vince, uh, who's, who's a, a professional teaching, um, you also have some of the best stuff, too, because, you know, the, the chairs itself, the gaming chairs, you know, you wouldn't see these gaming chairs in a classroom. A, a typical classroom kind of has the old school chairs and and, you know, the, these chairs, they're 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 extremely comfortable if, if you've never sat in one. Yeah. Um, but 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 Vince, so so kind of give us kind of give us a, a little bit of a breakdown here of, of the room decoration and soundproofing. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, when we started this, it's kind of crazy to think about with you know different members coming in. This room was a blank room, you know, with gray walls. There was nothing in there. So to have that blank canvas and for what it looks like now, I actually bring a tear to my eye, but I'll start getting to some of more of the specifics. The first thing that I did is I really want to bring it into a futuristic, more aesthetically pleasing vibe. So we got the wallpaper, um, you know, it's 3D textured. It looks really cool. The kids love that. And then the soundproofing to me was extremely important. One of my other uh, colleagues is really good with audio. Right when we walked in the room, we started talking. It was very tinny and a lot of reverberation in the room because it's a big, big classroom. And it's uh, it was very important for me to have the soundproofing in as many places as was physically possible because now when you're in there, it just like it just centralizes all the sound and it just it just it just feels so much better and it feels like a gaming arena without losing all of that sound that's bouncing around and uh the lighting i think is so important because it's eye catching for the kids when we show it off to other students and stuff like that kids will walk by my classroom and be like well what's going on in there what, what are you doing in there teachers are looking in like what's going on because it looks like kind of like a gaming playland when all the lights are off so those two, th those three things right off the bat brought the room from being just a gray room into more of a studio arena type of feel. But then all the other stuff that we're going to discuss kind of added the finishing touches. So, yeah, uh, here we have, like I mentioned in the in the video, we got the Nintendo Switch stations, which I really uh, felt like we needed the bigger monitors because sometimes I'll have eight people playing Mario Kart or six people playing Smash against each other. Uh, and it gets really intense. And on the little, on the smaller monitors, I'm not sure if that would have worked. We also had to get the uh, the dock. So a switch is normally played handheld like this, but to make it a more uh, competitive environment and have people be able to play on the same console, we got the docks that you see there. It's actually what's holding the um, the switches, if you can see there, and allows us to put the image through the monitor. And then finally, we have adapters. Some people prefer GameCube controllers over the Joy Cons. So to give them the ability to play with the pro controllers, we have adapters there that allow them to use the red control that you see there. And then this is my favorite part, being a uh, instructor now and being an educator, you need this middle area because it is sometimes hard to transition and control kids when they come in and they think they only are playing. So having a hub that has no consoles on it and just is the learning area, I have all the kids roll their chairs, uh, within reason, obviously, because they like to roll around already, roll into the middle area, all facing the Promethean board, and allows me to monitor if anyone is not paying attention, stuff like that, and allows everyone to see the board clearly. Clearly, And then also, as much as I don't want there to be any food and drink in there, they are younger kids sometimes, and they want to eat some food, have some snacks, 
So I allow them to go to the middle area without having any, any fear of destroying my, you know, Xboxes or monitors <laughs> in, in, in the room. So um, again, when I come in, the students at this point know to sit around there. It is super, it, it just, it's just inspiring to come in and see that they already know that to sit around that area. And that's when we're going to be learning. And then once I'm done, we can disperse and everybody goes to their, their point. All right, and then the final uh, the final part I think we're going to talk about today is an 11 foot long green screen that we had. This was extremely important for me. I do have a little bit of a mini background in YouTube and in streaming. So knowing that also combined when I commentate on the side for a uh, NFT company, I understand that a green screen is essential. And also every single university I went to that takes esports seriously has a green screen area where they broadcast the games, they stream the games, it's there for interviews. We could do all different types of content production in this area and also ties into one of the lessons that we have, which is on streaming. Um, so it was super important for me to get that and start teaching the kids. Because again, when I had to learn how to use a green screen, it was me on Google, on YouTube, trying to figure it out. We're trying to kids engage with the kids in different, um, different ways and different paths that are, evolved, uh, are revolving around the esports uh, profession. Yeah, so, so as you can see, everything, that, everything that's in this classroom was really well thought out and, and, and was kind of built out um, for the longevity of the program. So it wasn't built out to just get in, play games and leave. You know, we, we, want, we want this classroom to be the, the, the room that we have to kick students out because, you know, it's time to go like, you know, it's, it's 6, 7, 8 p.m. type of deal. Um, so we, we want this to be able to allow, you know, whether a student is actually into actually playing the game or whether a student might be into shoutcasting and broadcasting, th this now gives multiple channels um, for, for them to kind of use their, their unique ability um, and then also to, to get their passion out. So that, that's pretty much the wrap of, 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 our, of our presentation um i think we're yeah we're, we're pretty much right at that that kind of mark so i don't know if there's any questions um or kelly if you have anything for us that that you'd like for for, for us to kind of answer well first of all i want to thank both of you because i think um i find the presentation it's very engaging and if schools are not doing this they actually should be doing this you know this is something that um, when you went into those essential skills about being able to be problem solvers and the critical thinking skills. And, and I love that whole section around being a team leader. I mean, that's really, really important. And it's also knowing when to lead and knowing when, you know what, you can be a great contributor and there's nothing wrong with that, right? It's playing off of everyone's skills. So I really do appreciate that. Um, I was, I would love to hear maybe a, um, could you give an example, like a story, a concrete story of, you know, maybe where you saw something that kind of sparked something within a student and it was kind of that relevant life-changing moment there for them? Um, so even just recently, um, I have a lesson that focuses on mental health. Uh, it's actually called Gamer Health and we do physical injuries and mental health injuries. And honestly, it gave me goosebumps that you asked that and I have one readily available because it was something that I kind of took a shot in the dark. I did a breakout group with the class after we had the mental health lesson where I actually shared my story of dealing with depression uh, after my grandmother passed away while I was in the league. Um, it was a really rough time for me. So I actually put myself into the lesson to give them the truest example possible. So the class after that, we had a breakout group where I, I basically asked the students, and it's going to sound a little crazy, but I asked them, when was the last time that they cried? And I, it, the reason why I asked was not to know why they cried, but was to talk about the grieving process. So a lot of students shared, which was super engaging to me. They were actually happy to talk about times they were sad and that they shared it with their friends. That was my focus to show that you need to be able to talk to your friends, right? So I go about my, I'm good, I'm about to teach them. Uh, I mean, I'm about to let them play. And I look and a group of four students set up their own little group. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? They're like, oh, we're just talking about the last time we cried. And I was like, it caught me off guard because I'm like, like, this wasn't a necessity. This wasn't uh, something that I asked them to do. They just were so inspired by their student sharing and they were laughing and, and, and having fun with it and taking it seriously at the same time. It was honestly surreal. It was probably one of the best moments I've had, uh, especially because the lesson revolved around my own pain and, and depression that I dealt with. Thank you for sharing that. That's, that's an awesome example there. And I think, 
you know, oftentimes when we think about the gaming, you think about that isolation, right? And especially with all the technology that you have out there. But in the reality is, is that if we can learn to kind of communicate with one another through this, how do we build those support networks? I think that's really, really important there. Exactly. Um, I, I had another question and this is for parents. So if we're a school, wherever we are, um, that's watching this now, and yes, I want to get esports on board within my school. I think it's really cool. Uh, do you have a way to converse with parents around this so that the parents don't sit there and think, why am I going to let my child participate in this? So could you just talk a little bit about the parent aspect? Yeah, so as, as far as the parent aspect goes, um, you know, the, the materials that we the materials that we have and the materials that we provide is really where we hope that the parents can utilize that and, and kind of understand um, where, where we're coming from. As far as the conversation goes, um, you know, we're always available. Um, you know, if, if anyone has any questions, we, we give out, you know, we have our, our, our phone numbers out there. We give out our emails. Uh, so any parents that have questions, um, I think the best part about kind of from from CEI standpoint is, you know, we ha we have a professional gamer on staff. So uh, on top of, you know, on top of the educational side of, of, of our, our, our company, um, you know, we're walking, you know, we're walking the walk and we're talking the talk. So, you know, if if there's any concerns uh, around any specific topics, um, our staff has such a unique background that we could kind of cover any any real topic around gaming and, and how it kind of relates. So um, when it comes to that, yeah, it, it really kind of comes down to kind of connecting with us, reaching out, asking any questions. Uh, if there's any concerns, we always answer any concerns. And 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 really, it's just about providing as much as much material that we can, uh, because we know that it's kind of limited right now. Um, in terms of what's actually out there and trying to find that that resource is going to be tough. Um, so we're hoping that we could kind of be the the, the hub and 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 the the outlet for uh, any any parents that have any concerns around any topic uh, in in this space. Terrific. And if I could ask you both just to put your emails in the chat room, why I kind of close us down here, um, yeah. because first and foremost, I want to thank both of you. And so, you know, there was a lot of information that was shared. If you're looking at a way to bring this to your school, I want you to reach out um, to dad and Vince, because I think this is an incredible opportunity for students. Um, you can also obtain more information at CEI's website, which is the-cei.org. So check that out because there's a lot of resources and materials that they have. And I think one of the beauties of, of this presentation around esports, and then you look at the overall offering of CEI, um, there's a lot of synergy that's there. So there's a lot of support that can actually be provided to your school for to the teachers as well as the students there too. Um, if anyone has questions um, as we kind of move forward in this, uh, we have our monthly webinars that we're doing. Do not hesitate to reach out to myself. Um, we're going to continue this learning journey. Next month, we have um, ITEA, which this is a really nice technology and engineering follow up after this. So to hear from this way of the esports to continuing down that pathway around technology and engineering will be really interesting. So again, I want to thank everybody today. I want to thank folks that are able to see this at a later time and around the uh, globe here. Um, we're really excited about this. And as always, um, I get excited for esports. You know, I, I used to love the arcades. You know, I could play like Pac-Man in some of those sports too. I like Tron, by the way, so I'm dating myself. <laughs> but, you know, I think it's great. So again, don't hesitate to reach out to these two gentlemen as well as to look at the offerings of CEI. So with that, I want to thank you both to have a wonderful day. Thank our audience. And we look forward to hearing from everyone. Thank, thank you. you.